Hello everyone, my name is Lilian Hernandez and I have the honor to introduce our, speak our speaker for today, Colonel Emilio Otero Jr. Retired U.S. Air Force, Colonel Emilio Otero Jr. was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico to a family of iconic broadcast and university professors. Colonel Otero received a double major from Iowa University in political science, journalism, as well as two master's degree in international relations from Troy University and strategic studies from Air Force War College. During his military service, Colonel Otero was involved in key military operations during September 11, Operation Enduring Freedom, and Operation Iraqi Freedom, as well as worked with U.S. Special Operations in numerous countries. After 20 years of military service, including 14 years at, as the senior military officer at the U.S. Central and Special Operations Command in Tampa, Colonel Otero retired to pursue a career in media as a military and political comment commentator and defense intelligence consultant. He has also been a candidate for U.S. Congress, been named 2014 Tampa Bay Hispanic Man of the Year, and has been honored for both military and civilian world of his outstanding service. The Hispanic Heritage Committee and Del Mar Campus Student Government Association welcomes Colonel Otero Jr. Yeah, round of applause. How you doing, folks? Excellent. I don't want to take too much of your time because I know there's food ahead and there's a lot of important things going on. But uh, I am delighted to be here. I am uh, honored. Uh, this, are one, this is one of the institutions that uh, folks here in Tampa and around the state of Florida and in nearby states uh, look up to. They admire what you folks do at Hillsborough Community College. They admire the quality and the excellence that comes out of the students uh, from Hillsborough Community College. This is Hispanic Heritage Week. And uh, when Hispanic Heritage uh, Week, day, month is celebrated, uh, I take great pleasure on it. Because every time that I have been a part of it, it has been either here in Florida, Iowa, Texas, Greece, Italy, whatever, whatever the world and whatever my career has taken me, that's where I end up going. Um, I've always found myself in situations in which, well, you know, uh, at the time, Lieutenant Otero is the first Hispanic to do X, Y, or Z. Captain Otero is the first Hispanic to do X, Y, or Z. Uh, Major, Lieutenant Colonel, and then Colonel is a, the first Hispanic to do X, Y, or Z, or uh, achieve something, and then he was followed by um, a Hispanic. So it is, it is a title of pride to be a Hispanic. It is a title that, um, it is uh, something that is in your blood. It's something that you inherit. It is a culture that surrounds you, that gives you a different flavor on how things happen. But it does not detract and it doesn't change from the fact that what you're doing not only affects Hispanics, but affects other people. And if in those times, when I have done things and people say, you know, Colonel Otero, he also happens to be Hispanic, or he, also, he happens to be from Puerto Rico, or his father is a, a Cuban, or so and so and so. If that adds to the attention of what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve, so be it. And uh, I, I, I relish that, and I'm very proud of that. Um, there's a couple of things that you cannot escape. Uh, for example, in my case, um, I'm a colonel. I retired as a colonel. The percentage of Hispanics in the Air Force, in the ranks of major to colonels, is less than 3%. The percentage in the Air Force of colonels, Hispanics, is less than 1%. And a smaller number if you subdivide it by how many of Cuban descent, Puerto Rican descent, and so on. So what happens is that you have a different twist in your career, despite of all the things that you do. I did a number of things. Uh, during 9-11, I was here at Central Command. I had a small little office of four people. I was looking to retire the following year. 9-11 happened, and that changed that. God decided that I'm gonna switch your path in life to do other things and affect people in different ways. And the doldrums of the daily routine of my little office acquired a new sense of inspiration and a new sense of 
what is right or wrong, not only for my command and the people that work for me, but for the world. I was the guy that built the uh, intelligence support for anybody that was going to Afghanistan. And when one day General Franks decided that he was going to put the headquarters forward in Qatar, he selected two people. It was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Urrutia Barjal, who happens to be of Mexican descent, and me. So we were actually two Hispanics that led the buildup of the Central Command headquarters in Qatar. And I'm very proud of that, because the unique things did happen. There was a lot of support that went into doing that. At the beginning, I only had six people in my office, and I ended up within a month and a half later, I had 80. I had, was running all over the world trying to do things. I was negotiating with the Pakistanis. I was negotiating with the, uh, uh, with the Afghan uh, forces that were helping us. I was going all over the world trying to do things. And uh, in the little back of my head, I always thought, you know, there is this little guy from San Juan, Puerto Rico. It's here right now talking to a uh, minister of defense of Pakistan, trying to get rights for our drones at the time to be used out of Pakistan and take off out of Pakistan. Later after that, I found myself uh, backing in meetings the Secretary of Defense as part of his expert team uh, in negotiating agreements with other countries like Jordan, Poland, Colombia. I actually drafted, negotiated the agreements, and the Secretary of Defense signed them. And again, I found myself as a little guy that would go in San Juan to La Placita in old San Juan and, uh, you know, uh, carouse, had a good time, dance salsa, enjoyed my music. And there I am, thrown into the center of what was happening in the world, what everybody was looking at. And you cannot escape that. And there's only one thing that keeps you, that took you, that got you to that level, and that kept you at that level and further. And that is a sense of excellence. So whether a person is Hispanic or not, there's almost a requirement for excellence that you got to have within you to excel. And then tied to that is when you have a sergeant in the middle of Baghdad, right after we went into Baghdad, at the Saddam's Palace Lake, and everything had been bombed. And the kid happened to be an African-American kid. And he came over and he talked to me and uh, he said, this is tough. I said, it is tough. This guy just eight months earlier was in high school. And now he found himself, he went through the, uh, through the, uh, uh, through the war from the south into Kuwait and into Baghdad, did a lot of, uh, a lot of things. And uh, he found himself in need of a shoulder. But the needs, our needs of Hispanics, minorities, at different times are different. And you sometimes try to go to somebody that may be able to understand you a little bit better. And I was the only minority. And I tried to guide this young African-American man. And I told him to be proud of what he was doing. And I told him to be proud of what he will become after that. His girlfriend left him. He said that uh, it was the hardest thing that he was going through along with the war and all these other things. He's a kid. He just left high school. But then what I told him is, what you're doing right now is you're building a resume, young man, that is gonna make an, any young woman proud when you get back. You're gonna be a hell of a man. Nobody is gonna match what you're doing. Nobody's gonna match what you're going through right now. And I made it very clear to him. As an African-American young man, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to inspire your brothers and sisters. And not only the African-American community, but all minorities. And then I use as an example, my inspiration, my academic inspiration, despite my mom. My mom uh, was amazing, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. But my inspiration was George Washington Carver. How many people know who George Washington Carver is? For those that don't know, he knows. He's walking, he's going to class. God bless you. George Washington Carver was son of slaves. He went to Iowa. And in Iowa, I was having a tough time because I barely spoke English. I was going to college from Puerto Rico. I was struggling, but I knew that I was gonna excel. I was gonna do well. I would, I would not become a statistic. I refused to become a statistic. First of all, my mother would have killed me, and my father would not have allowed it anyway. 
but I refuse to become a statistic. The College of Science and Humanities in Iowa State was Carver Hall. And then I wanted to read into that. In the middle of Iowa, what a great story of George Washington Carver. A humble man, son of slaves, poor, didn't seek money, didn't seek anything. He actually slept in his lab. And he's the father, he's one of the fathers of what we know today as genetics. He actually used the soybeans as the foundation of his research. The man was an amazing man. He's one of the greatest men in the history of this country and in the history of the world. But when you read his history, it is not driven by money. It is driven by education. It is driven by giving to others. And the only way that he could effectively give to others was by filling his head, by learning, by being a productive member of society, by doing something that, was, that would help other people. From there, he went on to Tuskegee, Tuskegee Institute, where he continued his research and did other great things. At the time, Iowa State University had 24,000 students. There were 14 Hispanics, and I was one of them. So I had that pressure on top of that, because everybody's looking at you. There's only 14. And my desire was, I need to show the world, I need to tell the world that I can excel. Nothing would hold me back. And I graduated with two degrees, with journalism and political science. I was president of the student body. I was in the, in the Council of Science and Humanities. I did a number of things for my own, because it was my own interest. I was an in ROTC. It was my own interest that I was doing those things, but also because I wanted to excel. I wanted to be an inspiration to others. I just happened to be a Hispanic. And I saw myself inspiring many people of all backgrounds because of my achievement. And then the Hispanic students, the 13 guys other than me that were there, were inspired as well because of the things I, I was doing at the time. My mother and my father instilled that in me, instilled a sense of excellence, instilled the sense that you have to be an example for others. Because there were other, other, there were role models and examples for them before them. My mother was the first woman television director in Puerto Rico and one of the first in Latin America in 1952. In 1948, she was in radio. At the time, women doing those things, it was pretty, pretty difficult, but she did it. My father, my father graduated from high school but didn't go to college. He couldn't, he was from Cuba. And at the time, there were tough times. There was a depression going on around the world that was still affecting many countries. He had to work. And he became a newscaster on radio at the age of 18. And then he went to Puerto Rico and he was the first voice that went out in Telemundo. How many people know what Telemundo is here? Well, my father was the first voice that went out and said, este es Telemundo. That was the first voice. And then he became the first newscaster for Telemundo. What we didn't know at the time, he had, that he was the third in the United States. So that was, we were pretty proud about that. My father was a humble man. My mother was a humble woman. She is a humble woman. And they all made it very clear. Whatever you do, you're always setting an example for others. And then there is a caveat in there of minorities, and then there is a sub-caveat of Hispanics. Not because they will remain in that caveat of Hispanics and minorities, but because you are supposed to inspire them to achieve and provide for everybody else, for everybody. We gotta be one with everybody. We just happen to be Hispanic. And if that one little thing gets to be a, a, an inspiration, so be it. Education for some people defines their grade in the classroom, and that's it. People say, well, I'm doing well in the classroom, and that's that. And some people say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get an A in the class, and then I'm gonna make a lot of money with the degree that I'm getting. And that's what's driving a lot of young men today and a lot of young women. I wanna make a lot of money. A lot of the examples, a lot of the role models that we have out there is very financially driven. Artists, singers, athletes. But what we fail to understand, because somewhere in the past 30 years or so, we have failed to understand 
that the greatness of those entertainers and athletes and so on took a lot of hard work and took a lot of study. They became the best and they study and they were more knowledgeable in their field than anybody else. It is the most, it is the most uh, evident that you see. But we have forgotten about other people out there that did terrific things. That, re that, that they, they reach towards education and they pull themselves up by doing really well in education, not because of the amount of money that we're gonna get, because that we're gonna be a contributor to society. The money, or, or recognition, or a better life, comes with that education. Today, nowadays, we settle, we find ourselves settling, and it is disturbing. It is disturbing to me. There's a lot of, eh, whatever. Yeah, I don't care. Well, it is what it is. Well, I am who I am, and people have to accept me, and this and that. Well, I work for this institution, therefore, yeah, but the institution has to adjust itself to me, not me to the institution. And that's wrong. You adjust yourself to the institution that you're working for or that you're studying. Yeah. That's the way that works. There's a lot of people today in which, in a sense, a younger generation that I am troubled about. Many of you here, Many of the students that are coming here realize that. And they say, I'm done with this. I'm done with what I'm doing. And this is a key for me to go someplace else. This education, this buildings, the education is the intangible. The tangible are the buildings and the classes and the professors and the things that you need to do to pass those tests and do well and excel in academia. But the minute that you settle for a D or a C or something like that, that that is good enough, that's a time that you are selling yourself out. Not sure. You're selling yourself out to mediocrity. And when it comes to the Hispanic population, and I look at the kids, the trend of kids graduating from high school, it's the lowest in the country. Among all minorities, Hispanic kids, the dropout rate in high school is the highest in the country. So I could tell you some wonderful statistics, and I can tell you about some great things about Hispanics doing well in academia and in science and, and, and a bunch of other things. But the reality is that we're in the middle of a struggle. We're in the middle of trying to inspire these young men and these women. We're in the middle of trying to send the message behind these walls and these buildings, the message that has been projected by the parents, by the teachers, by the students here, we're having a struggle going back and sharing it with these young men and women that have given up. And their desire, and I have talked to thousands of them, thousands. I have gone into their neighborhoods, I have gone into their homes, and they have given up. They say, well, I'm not good enough. Well, I don't speak English well. Well, there's always an excuse. We live in a society of excuses nowadays. We gotta give that up. Only then are we going to get back to what we were. Only then are we going to be an example to others. Only then are we going to be an example to the rest of the world. And I'm not talking in military terms because I was in the military. No, forget about the military part. I am emphasizing the achievement part. That's what I want. If you happen, whatever it is that you do, be the best at what you do. Learn everything about that you're, what you're doing. Never settle for a paycheck or for something that it's just going to get you by. Because what you're doing is that you're betraying everything that the parents did for you, everything that you could do for your kids and the generation that follows. Trust me, you don't want to be, and nobody today wants to be, a grandparent in the near future. Because it's near, life is about this short. Even though you may be 20, near future is not that far. It got to me like that. When you get to be a grandparent and you have a child that is coming to you looking for inspiration, he wants to do something, he wants to achieve, he's self-motivated, and you don't have the tools to inspire him or her. And then you give up and you say, well, you know, just figure it out. Talk to your professor, talk to your advisor, talk to your mom, talk to somebody else. The thing is that we all have that responsibility. Whether you're 18, 19 years old, or whether you're 65, you have a responsibility to inspire for educational excellence anybody that comes and talks to you. 
If it's a 40-year-old person that decided that he was going to go back to school, he was tired of struggling and things becoming hard. He got tired of what we have been uh, hearing about, the school of hard knocks. How many of you have heard that? School of hard knocks. I went to the University of Hard Knocks with pride. They say that with pride. And you know what? That's okay. But it's only one tool. If you happen to take that route, for whatever reason, family reasons, personal choices in life that drove you there, that got you there, and you have to pull yourself back up, absolutely, that is fine. But don't settle. Because you can be 45 years old and still have dreams. You can still may want to be a PhD, be a dean of, a, of one of the schools in this campus or any other campus. You can be a researcher. You can be a thought driver. Just because you had a tough time when you were growing up, and just because you had a tough time in your decisions, perhaps, doesn't mean that you don't have the same opportunity and the same chance of the young man or the young woman that did well from kindergarten up. We all have the same opportunity. Don't throw in the towel. We don't throw in towels. We don't do that. In this country, we don't do that is not in the DNA of this country. And anybody that is sitting here with us understands that, at least have heard about it. It is unacceptable, like I said before, that the rate of students, Hispanic students, dropping out of high school is the highest in this country. Unacceptable with the rich culture that we have, with all the wonderful things that we bring to the table, with all the experiences that we bring to the table, from our parents, from our grandparents, things that work, things that didn't work in their countries, and then come to this country that gives you the opportunity. Because that's the only thing this country offers, opportunity. You don't find that in any other place in the world. Opportunity. Once you seize that opportunity, whether you're Hispanic, African American, Asian, whatever you are, from Wyoming, once you seize that opportunity, then you have given yourself a chance. Never throw in the towel. The only time that you can throw in the towel academically or educationally is when you die. How many of you have heard stories of 90-year-old ladies that decided to go back and finish her high school degree? How many of you have heard the story of the 85-year-old woman from Tennessee that got her college degree? Why? Why did she do that? because she did not give up. Those two women did not give up. They had more to offer to this world. And if you listen to some of the interviews of the 90 year old lady that finished high school, her desire was to be able to have credibility when she gave advice to her great grandchildren that were going to high school. That's it. That's the only thing she wanted. But you needed education to do that. Education is the fuel to your mind. Education is not just an A in the class, because I can guarantee you many kids are going to get C's. Many kids are going to be average students. Not everybody is going to be great, whatever they do. You're going to get them, but don't give up. I was an okay student in high school. I was okay. Okay. Nothing. I was a, an athlete and a good student. I was a good student. I did great in my uh, SATs and my ACT when I applied for college. I did really well, but you know, it's one of those things. I was uh, struggling with English, and when my freshman year in high school, I decided I'm going to overcome all this. And I started listening to people speaking as I was talking to other people so I could, so I could engage both sides of my brain in the process of the English language. And then I excelled in the class. And then I graduated in 2005 from the War College one of the toughest academic institutions in this country for military, but it is one of the toughest. They're all colonels. Many of them have PhDs and all those things. And I went to the War College and I graduated 15th in the class out of 250. My message, my message, it could be a very esoteric and very undefined message of you can do really well and everybody can do really well. That you hear that all the time, but I'm not gonna lie to you. There's some that I will not. There's some that I will struggle. 
The point is not give up. The point is to understand that you need to pull yourself from the societal environment in which we live in, in which it is all about ourselves and about selfies and about all these other little things about ourselves. If it's good for me, it's fine. If I do this, then I'm going to make money. We got to pull ourselves from that. When you look around, you have all kinds of examples of people that are bigger than themselves. We have one right here, Norma Reno, Hispanic Woman of the Year. She is the kind of person that I'm talking about. She gives herself to everybody, everybody, no matter where they are, no matter what group they belong to, she is committed to all of them. But what she does should not be a unique thing. It should be everybody. Everybody has a responsibility. When we were children, the older folks in the crowd, older, don't take it personal, in the crowd, sometimes the neighbors would call our attention when we were doing bad things, right? Now we're afraid to do that. You don't have to spank, you don't have to pull the ear, you don't have to do any of those things, but you can bring to their attention of the children. You can talk to the parents, you can, you can, you can participate in the societal process of improving ourselves, of what's right and what's wrong. There's two ways to do things, the right way or the wrong way. That's it. It's your choice which one you take. If you want to do something the wrong way, understanding what the consequences are going to be, press on. If you know that doing X, Y, or C is going to throw you in jail, do it. But I expect you that once you're in jail and you learn your lesson, when you come back out, you start reaching against for excellence and saying, I'm not going to do this again. I'm going to make myself better. If you happen to make the right choices and you decided to do whatever that you wanted to do and you do really well, God bless you. But you know what? It's not just for you. It's for everybody else around you. It's for the kids that are talking to you. I find myself, friends of mine, call to go and talk to children, troubled children and give them inspiration for education and not give up and many of my friends don't want to because they're tough neighborhoods and they're whatever reason and there's about a couple of people that I can count on that I can go and talk to those children sometimes you know what how many of you have had one person in your life that said one thing that changed your outlook for the future many there was a one person, it could be a grandmother, it could be a father, it could be, it could be a friend, it could be a neighbor, it could be, it could be a friend of your own age that said something so sage and so wise that you took it to heart. To me, it was consequences. Because in Puerto Rico, I grew up, uh, I grew up, uh, I was, uh, I mean, I was, I gave my parents a lot of gray hairs early. And my father used to tell me, he said, listen, you do whatever you want. If the cops bring you here sometime, you gotta deal with the consequences. If you can accept the consequences, do it. But if you cannot accept the consequences, if what is gonna happen afterwards is not acceptable to you, give up. Don't do it. Don't do it. And the one thing that is gonna give you the reason and the way to measure what is right and what is wrong in many cases is your parent in many cases the parents are not there in many cases it's the friends and the neighbors in many cases they're not there so at the end of the day it's you and what you learn you make decisions based on your education it's a blend education is not just a school of hard knocks education is not just the daily life Education is not just getting A, B's and C's in, in college and in high school. Education is a blend of all that and how wisely you put it all together and you learn. And then sharing it with others. Because the society depends on that. So if there is a message I can deliver to you is that. Fun and games are all right. You can have fun and games and you can laugh and you can joke around and all those things. And you can say whatever. There are times in which you're going to say whatever. But that should not define you. What should define you is your desire to be able
to put the whatever attitude and the me attitude aside and do things that are bigger than you. I said, okay, I did that, but I gotta go back to school. I gotta go back to school. Or I gotta study. Or I gotta be a role model for my fellow Hispanics or whoever you wanna be a role model for. There's always somebody looking at you, guaranteed. If you're a 17 year old star athlete in high school, it, the kids are looking up to you. If you happen to be a straight A student in high school, the kids are looking up to you. There's always somebody looking up to you, so watch yourself. Do the right thing. Because you are also looking up somebody else. I am 54 years old, and I'm always looking at other people that inspire me. I seek them out every day. I don't say, well, you know, I was a colonel, and well, you know, my dad, yeah, well, my mom, I'm good, it's all good. No, it isn't, it isn't. We're human, and I struggle. I struggle with thoughts. I struggle with ideas. And I've got to look at other people that inspire me to channel those ideas. It can be normal. It can be friends of mine. It can be, I always reach back to George Washington Carver as an inspiration. General Hector Pagan. General Hector Pagan, one of the most incredible people you would meet, by the way. The first Hispanic general officer of special forces. By the way, he lives here in Tampa. He was a commander of all special operations in Iraq at the beginning. So I look at people, historical people. I read, because you know what reading is? Education is not reading because you have to for a class. It is reading because you're expanding your mind. People say, some people say, well, you know, if you're really good at something, you're a genius at it. But you know what Michelangelo said? Michelangelo. Who many people here, who, who thinks that Michelangelo is a genius? He didn't think he was a genius. You know what he said? Michelangelo says, you know, it is amazing how people confuse a lot of hard work with genius. That's what Michelangelo said. So at the end of the day, if you're willing to study hard, if you're willing to seek and look at an objective, if you're willing to understand your purpose, and how you inspire others, and how you will continue looking at others to inspire you, then you're doing the right thing. Then it is a remarkable thing. It's not just the A that you pull out of the class, look everybody, I got an A, Hey, great. Well, you know what? The kid that got the B in the class may be looking up to you, wanting to do as well as you did, and may be shy to come up and tell you, hey, what, what, how do you do this? Sometimes you have to reach out, especially if you know the person. Excellence is free. God gave us all a brain. That is a repository of knowledge. It is up to you the quality of knowledge that you put in there. For you to understand where we live in, how we live where we live, how we're gonna motivate others to excel It drives me nuts. I don't know if you have seen in some TV shows when they have uh, people on the street and they ask them questions. Who's this guy, the president of the United States, and they don't know. Who is, uh, what, uh, uh, what are the Bill of Rights, and they don't know. Um, uh, it drives me nuts. Those things are not ideological. You gotta know those things. It's knowledge. The minute that you give up on knowledge, you're giving up on yourselves and you're giving up on your society. You can achieve mediocrity all you want and be cool all day long. That's fine. But I'd rather be cool and successful. I'd rather be cool and working hard and achieving something that is gonna make me, my daughter, my grandkids proud. That are gonna make my parents proud. And hopefully that will make any young Hispanic, young woman or lady come up to me, look at me in the eyes, ask me, because I happen to inspire them. That's not ego speaking. That's a responsibility. Everybody that is here listening to me, regardless of your background, that's a responsibility that you have. You have a responsibility to nurture the future those before you or anybody that is willing to listen with quality of advice, knowledge, and brilliance.
That's your responsibility. I just want to say thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you. I hope I didn't bore any of you. I didn't see anybody nodding off, so that's always a good thing. But God bless you all. Thank you so much. And I believe there's a question and answer.